Darwinism has ruled science for over 150 years, but few today know the details of its less than stellar track record. Let's discover some evolutionary blunders which demonstrate how extrapolations of vivid evolutionary imaginations explain why evolutionists have made and will continue to make embarrassing scientific blunders. Coming up on today's edition of Origins, Evolutionary Blunders with Dr. Randy Galuza. Hello and welcome to Origins. I'm Ray Heipel. It's an honor to be your host today. During this program, we showcase interesting guests who present evidence from science along with other important facts validating the truth of creation and the accuracy of the Bible. Today's guest, Dr. Randy Galuza, has undergraduate degrees in engineering and theology. He has earned an MD and also a Master of Public Health from Harvard University. Dr. Galuza is a registered professional engineer. In 2008, he retired as Lieutenant Colonel from the U.S. Air Force. Now he's the president for the Institute for Creation Research in Dallas. Welcome to the program, Dr. Galuza. Thank you so very much, Ray. Evolutionary Blunders. That sounds like a fantastic title for a great program. What are we going to be talking about today? Well, we're going to be talking today about this whole area where evolutionists imagine a lot of things and they, um, they get into trouble after a bit of time when they see too much that really isn't there and they're only seeing it in their imagination. Okay. And in fact, I wrote a whole book on all of this called 20 Evolutionary Blunders. Now, we don't have anywhere near enough time today to go through 20 of those, but if someone was interested in that, they could go to our webpage at ICR. Org, and they could pick up this book and cover some of the other ones that are out there. But what we really want to do today is just have a friendly conversation with some evolutionists and just see what they see and why they say it. And so we're going to have to talk about this whole phenomenon called imagination, which all of us have and what they really are, basically these mental images or sensations. But as you know, some of them can be tied to reality, and some of them aren't tied to reality. Absolutely. Imagination is a good thing. God gave us our imagination, but sometimes it can get us into trouble. Yes. In fact, it, when it runs wild, it gets us into trouble an awful lot. And I'd like to just step up to the screen and point out some of the things where evolutionists have gone astray. All right, Ray. So the very first one is the one that everybody has heard about, and that is Piltdown Man. In fact, it's kind of like the archetype of all these major evolutionary blunders, which are based on imagination. In fact, it all starts way back in 1913. This is the original paper that was published in Science, in which they are actually describing what they see, but they're not really seeing what's really there. In fact, it says that of Piltdown Man, that he was a discovery of the greatest importance, the nearest approach we have yet to reach a missing link. You know, everybody's looking for one of those. Probably few will deny that Eanthropus, that is early man, Dawsona, named after the man who discovered it, is almost, if not quite, as much human as Simeon, that is a higher primate. But the fact is, they were just seeing those features in their mind because this is what was discovered. These are the bones right there on the screen. You see a part of a skull cap and you see part of a jaw bone. And that was one that was an ape and one that was human. And the people who were looking at these things, guess what? This is what they imagined. From those features, from those fragments, they were able to get that. And that's quite an imagination. Not only do you have this fully uh, formed creature, but you have the background and the trees, and uh, they, they're very good at imagining things. Exactly, and when they were looking at 
part of the human features on these bones, they were imagining that they were seeing ape-like things and vice versa when they were looking at the apes, they were imagining that they were seeing human things. Well, this whole, this whole fiasco was basically and eventually uncovered and by 1954, there was a retraction. This paper also published um, in Science, The Great Piltdown Hoax. Now, what was involved in that hoax? This is a famous painting of the researchers from 1915, and they're studying those bones, and they're studying those fragments. And based on studying all of that, this paper says, the skull eventually brought knighthoods to three leading expositors. These learned gentlemen were honored after having spent many years in many pages discoursing on the very human features they discerned in Piltdown Man's ape-like jaw and the very ape-like features that they found in his human cranium. The Piltdown Skull illustrates the ever-present danger of scientists of seeing what they expect to see. And just for our viewers again, Piltdown Man was a total fraud. It was not a part ape, part human. That's exactly right. It was a total fraud. And I'm not here really to pick on them. I'm just here pointing out how imagination gets evolutionists into these major blunders along the way. But it wasn't just Piltdown Man that was there. There was another fossil that was discovered in 2009, Ida. And I bet you don't even remember Ida. I don't. That looks a little bit like maybe a Disney movie or yeah, something. Yeah, it was. Me. It's actually a, a <laughs> lemur that was discovered and it hit the scenes with a big splash You're back in 2009 and the Guardian says the fossil ID extraordinary find is the missing link in human evolution unprecedented insight into our ancestry we keep wow. finding that missing link you would think it wouldn't be missing anymore that's right you would think you would actually find all of the links and that this was actually in May of 2009 and here's where the imagination comes from this is David Attenborough he says the more you look at Ida the more you can see, as it were, the primate in embryo, as David Attenborough said. But he's doing the exact same thing that the men who deceived themselves with Piltdown Man are doing. He's looking at it and he's seeing exactly what he wants to see. The discoverer of Ida said that this one will be pictured in the textbooks for the next hundred years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That was in May of 2009. But by October of 2009, Controversial Ida was no missing link at all. In fact, this paper said it wasn't even a close relative to us. And it was just another major evolutionary blunder, which was based on imagination. In fact, they say Ida is, is as far removed from the monkey ape human ancestry as a primate could be. Another major evolutionary blunder, right in the shoe steps of Piltdown Man where you're seeing exactly what you expect to see. So they, they, they have a belief system. They, they believe that this is true, and so then they just try to find it and make it work. Exactly. They are interpreting the data through their belief system so they know exactly what they're expecting to find, and therefore they see it in their mind, but it's not really there mm. at all. In fact, this researcher, she's an evolutionist as well, she sums it up. We have only to recall the Piltdown adventure to see how easily susceptible researchers can be manipulated into believing that they have actually found just what they had been looking for on that. Imagination can get you trapped and it is this wholesale imagination which is causing these evolutionary blunders. So really, there's some take home lessons from Piltdown Man. One, Piltdown Man, as we can see, was not an anomaly, in fact, this blunder has been repeated several other times and we didn't have time to discuss it. And it is the prototype of these imagination-based blunders that they continue to have. It's imagination run wild. Yeah, it's not based upon what's really there, it's based upon what they really believe. And, then, and, yeah. and you know, in many ways, I think they actually see it. They're looking at it and since you're interpreting what the data is, in your mind, you can actually, as Jane said, see just exactly what you were looking for along those lines. But it's not just with the fossils. You can look at a fully functional organ like the human appendix, and you can imagine that maybe it's some kind of leftover organ from our ape-like 
ancestry. You know, Randy, I remember just when I was a kid being told the appendix we ha it has no use. We have no idea what the appendix does. It's a, an organ that doesn't do anything. Exactly. And I was told the exact same thing, and I was told that it was really good evidence for evolution because why would God make organs and bodies that have no use? And it was good evidence against the fact that we were created. And so they were looking at something and they were seeing a functionless organ, but it was really only in their imagination all along. In fact, this gentleman right here, Jerry Coyne, and not very long ago, as you can see from the date on the quote, 2005, he points out this same, same imaginary blunder. He says, the human body is also a palimpsest of our ancestry. Our appendix is the vestigial remnant of an intestinal pouch used to ferment the hard to digest plant diets of our ancestors. An appendix is simply a bad thing to have. It is certainly not the product of, an intelli of intelligent design. How many humans died of appendicitis before surgery was invented. So this isn't way back when we were kids. This is 2005. He's a leading researcher at the University of Chicago. He's retired now, but he's repeating the same thing. You know, the absolute certainty of this quote just really shows the arrogance of um, a man who is just certain that he knows what he's talking about. And, and we know now that that's completely wrong. It's completely wrong. But you, but you hit on a really important thing. When they say it with such certainty, it really sounds very convincing. And if you're just a student sitting in school, oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's very, very persuasive for them to see things very different from what they were taught. However, all of these papers, in fact, even when I was in medical school in the early 1990s, we knew that the appendix had very useful functions. And these papers have come out. I put them up here so that the viewers can turn to these papers if they want, but they point out the same thing, that the body's appendix has long been thought of as nothing more than a worthless evolutionary artifact, good for nothing save a potentially lethal case of inflammation, and that's exactly what we were taught. But they go on to say this, that it's actually pretty useful for it's involved more than 30 times, and they say, and one paper after another points out that this appendix has a useful function, including this quote, although it is widely viewed as a vestigial organ with little known function, recent research suggests that the appendix may serve an important purpose. They go on to add this right here. What if humans didn't have an appendix? This wasn't published very long ago as well. They had say that Charles Darwin suggested that the appendix was a vestigial organ from an ancestor that ate leaves, potentially helping them to digest food. Darwin speculated that the appendix no longer served a function much like the small triangular coccyx, or that is what people call the tailbone, at the base of the human spine, a remnant tailbone found in our distant ancestors. Now look at this. Right in this, where they're pointing out that we were wrong about the appendix, they repeat another, another imaginary tale about your tailbone. The fact of the matter is, the tailbone's a misnomer. It had no function as a tail. It never served a tail. And, and it serves important anatomical functions, just like the appendix is serving important functions. And Darwin was completely wrong. And all of his disciples were completely wrong when they talked about the appendix. Because this paper goes on to say, however, if Darwin knew what scientists know now about the appendix, he would have never have suggested it was a worthless vestige of evolution. William Parker, an associate professor of surgery at Duke University, said in the School of Medicine. The fact of the matter is, as they conclude, if the appendix vanished in a society with agriculture after people started living in settlements, I think more people would die. Wow. That's a pretty powerful statement. Pretty powerful. Yeah. I mean, com not just wrong, but completely wrong. You know, we now know that your appendix actually has tissue from your immune system. It can actually sample products as it's going through your digestive system. It can help adjust your immune response to those things. And in addition to that, it actually serves as a little storehouse for good bacteria that live in your gut. So if I gave you an antibiotic, for instance, 
and it wiped out the bacteria in your gut, your appendix will help seed it with fresh bacteria that are useful for you in your gut. You can live without it, of course, but it has a very useful function. And, and of course, that's what this quote is referring to, that as he says, in these areas with poor sanitation, where you would begin to get different bacteria and so forth, disease would spread more if it wasn't for the appendix helping to reset or helping to recognize and adjust the immune system. And so how many lives have been saved because we have an appendix, we'll never know. Yeah, that's a good point. You know, we know when it gets inflamed that, that it has to be removed, but how many lives have been saved or how many lives have been made better by it, we don't really know. In fact, everything is changing as we think about our relationship to the bacteria in our gut. You know, we used, to, we, we used to think of bacteria as almost a hostile relationship. The truth is now we live in close community, in close cooperation with those bacteria, and your immune system actually acts as an interface between you and the bacteria, enabling you to work together, and the appendix is one element of that system which serves a very, very useful function along those lines. You know, Randy, it reminds lines. me that you know, how many people um, and I've seen it on my phone pop up on my computer, you know, all these ads for probiotics. Get more good bacteria in your body. Now, you know, science is telling us to get some of this good bacteria. And so exactly as you said, that uh, we need these things and we're learning that about our body. It's not good that we just sterilize everything inside of us. Exactly. In fact, the, the probiotics, and you can get them in various foods types, are absolutely essential to you. And as you go from place to place and you eat different foods, your body will adjust the numbers and types of the bacteria in your gut so that you optimize your own response and nutritional response really that to the food that you're getting and one element of that whole system is this appendix. Unfortunately people are still repeating this and it's just another imagination based blunder by these evolutionists because we know it's not the same as a cecum now that you would find in a, a rabbit or a, a, veg, a vegetation eating creature of those things. Anyway, evolutionists thought that um, it had lost a function, it was an evolutionary remnant, but we now know it actually serves a very useful function. They were totally wrong about it being a vestigial organ and totally wrong about it not being good evidence for creation. Well, Randy, we'll have to stop you right there. Unfortunately, we have to take a break. Stay with us, we'll be back right after these messages. We hope you're enjoying Origins TV. It all started at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We've been producing new episodes for over 37 years now. We praise God for the success of the program and are excited to introduce you to Origins and to us. If you're interested in watching more episodes of Origins, you can find them on our YouTube page. Simply go to YouTube and search Cornerstone Television Network. Click the like and subscribe buttons, then you'll find the best episodes of Origins in our playlist. You can also visit our website at ctvn.org slash origins. One more way you can stay connected with us is to subscribe to our free monthly Hope Today newsletter, which you can do from our website. And if you have any questions, call us here at Cornerstone Television at 888-665-4483. We'd love to connect with you. Thank you for watching. Welcome back to Origins. We're talking to Dr. Randy Galuza, who's been sharing a little bit about evolutionary blunders. Randy, we left the program looking at this uh, word called vestigial. Scientists are talking about vestigial organs. What does that mean again? Well, that was an organ which they believed used to have a function on a creature in the past, but now in organisms or other creatures that supposedly have evolved from that creature or descended from that creature, it no longer has a function, or more recently they've been saying it has a changed function. But the whole idea was it had function in the past, it doesn't have function today, why would God create something without function, therefore it's evidence for evolution. Okay, so that the, a creature that was more primitive is now more complex, but not everything is caught up yet, there's a few leftover 
primitive organs as it were. Exactly. Okay, that's, that's an interesting thing. And of course, if it was true, it would certainly say, wow, we've evolved. The, these leftover organs are showing that. Right, it would be evidence for that, if it were true. Okay. And not something that they're just imagining. That's right, and since uh, they really never had any evidence for it, they just didn't know, for example, what the appendix did. And then, as you said, the imagination kicked in. Well, it must have been for a primitive creature. There was nothing really there that pointed that out. Well, what do we find out about the appendix here? Well, we found out that it's really not the same thing as a cecum at all, and it uh, has had a function all along, and it really points towards the creation of God. But, you know, this was something that um, is in the past, but there was actually another major blunder that they stumbled onto, which was also very much imagination-based. And it's something that we don't really talk a lot about and we don't really talk about in the United States. And that was our whole sad history of eugenics. Mm -hmm. Eugenics, in fact, I'll bet you there are a lot of people who are listening to us today who have never even heard of the word eugenics, even though it was something that was practiced in the United States. This is a picture right here from 1921 of the whole idea of eugenics. It was very, very popular right then. And I kind of give a definition of what it was. It was the quest to improve humanity's genetic composition by selectively breeding superior groups of people and eliminating inferior groups of people or preventing them from having children. Well, that sounds like some kind of uh, super villain in a Marvel movie or something that That's would right. do something exactly. like that. Exactly. We think of it, it really as something coming out of Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. but the reality is the whole idea of eugenics took off in Great Britain and the United States. In fact, there was a very, a very prominent man in Great Britain at the time, and we always think of Galton, but this was a man named Carl Pearson. He was a mathematician, and we still use some of his equations today in statistics, but he was a strong proponent of eugenics. And he ties it not to evolution, he ties it specifically to Darwin's concept of survival of the fittest called natural selection. And, he's, and I'm gonna read a quote here. This is actually a, a speech he was giving to medical doctors medical doctor, someone like me, way back in the early 1920s. He says, let me, even at the risk of talking about the familiar, sketch for you the broad outlines of Darwin's theory of evolutionary progress. The individual better fitted to its environment lived longer than its fellows, had more offspring, and these, inheriting its better fitness, raised the type of the race. Nevertheless, and this is a big nevertheless, Ray, Nevertheless, medical science has to face the fact that the upward progress of man in the past has been largely controlled by stringent, that means ruthless, Darwinian selection. And then he adds this, what will happen if by increased medical skill and by increased state support and private charity, we enable the weaklings to survive and to propagate their kind? In other words, if doctors intervene and actually save lives. I say that the general death rate is selective in many ways, medical science has led to the survival of the unfit. Civilized man has largely destroyed crude natural selection. Wow, so our advances in medicine now are making the human race less. So we should just let the weak die so that the strong can survive and the race will evolve faster. I mean, that sounds like some kind of false religion. He points out the study of how it is possible forms the subject of the matter of what we now term the science of eugenics. We have to replace the ruthless action of natural selection by reason conduct of civilized man. And what he means by that is forced sterilizations. And you'd be surprised that in the United States of America, over 30 states had laws forcibly sterilizing people and over 70,000 US citizens were forcibly sterilized until the final law was overturned in 1973. I've never heard that before. Never heard any of that yeah. before. Wow. In fact, this was a major blunder. It was a disaster. This man, Randolph Ness, who wants to bring selectionism into medical science, he at least acknowledges this. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, most applications were medical Darwinism that focused on the welfare of species in connection with eugenics, this led to moral and social disaster. Ray, this qualifies mm -hmm. as a major evolutionary blunder. This mm -hmm. whole idea that somehow natural selection 
is going to lead to upward mobility, this death-driven worldview, which Christians could never make peace with because death is an enemy and death is going to be destroyed. This is what people were, were tying to natural selection and eugenics. And it is this belief in natural selection which fueled eugenics. And it was this idea that humans could mimic natural selection which led to the extermination and the sterilization of so many of these people. And it wasn't evolution, it was Darwin's concept of natural selection which led to it. Well, I, we, we just have to uh, get the message out there, it seems to me, that, that God is creator and that people need to understand that so that they don't begin to think that we can manipulate a process by which we commit moral atrocities in the name of progress. Imagination can be a good thing, but at times it can really lead to disaster. Well, Randy, we're going to have to stop right there. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Fascinating information. I hope you'll join us again sometime. I will. I'd love to. Ever since the acceptance of evolutionary ideas, scientists have repeatedly claimed to have discovered compelling evidence and conclusive proof of the simple to complex evolution of all living things. But with the passing of time, we are finding that more and more of those confident claims are completely false. What real science actually shows is the intelligent design of all creation according to the wisdom and power of our heavenly creator. It's just one more example that we know what the Bible says is true and the proof, it's all around you. If you enjoy Origins, we sure could use your help to keep these creation television programs on the air. Your support, both prayerfully and financially, makes a big impact. So let's work together to reveal how awesome our Creator truly is. And we'll see you next time on Origins. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. For a DVD of this series, you can order online or send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins Program Number 2302, Cornerstone Network, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. This presentation was made possible by the faithful prayers and financial support of you, our Cornerstone family.